Okay, let's get started. Uh, first, just welcome and uh, happy Friday to everyone. Hope everyone is enjoying here in the Puget Sound region, a very rainy, uh, gloomy Friday morning here. Uh, but we are excited to talk about stormwater parks. Uh, really big thank you to Michelle, Jenny, Bethany for uh, helping us tell the story today and to Erica uh, for putting it on. Uh, I'll just, uh, my name is Ben Kahn. I'm an associate planner at PSRC. Um, I'll just provide a few uh, kind of logistical housekeeping points today before we get going. And then I will turn it over to Erica Harris to introduce the topic in our panel. Uh, so first you might notice uh, you do not, you're not able to uh, use your microphone or video during this uh, uh, webinar today. Um, instead, if we, we will run engagement through the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the Zoom uh, screen here. Um, so yeah, if you have questions for the panel, please uh, use the Q&A feature to uh, input them. Uh, staff will be monitoring them. And then when we have the Q&A portion of the event, of the event, we will do our best to relay uh, as many questions to our panelists. Uh, so a little bit about the format. We have about 20 minutes for presentation today and three panelists, plus an introduction by Erica. Um, and we will save all the questions for the Q&A session at the end. But if you do have uh, questions that you're thinking about as you're listening, please continue to uh, type them into the Q&A box. Uh, following the presentations, we're going to take just a five minute break and then return promptly for the Q&A. Um, and so we will be sure to communicate that as well. Uh, and if you are having any technical issues uh, using Zoom, please feel free to message me um, using Zoom, uh, the Q&A feature, or just send me an email. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat, but it is bcon at psrc.org. Uh, last couple of points is that we are recording this event and we will post the video and the slides to our website following the conclusion of it. And then if you are uh, AICP, we are offering two CM credits for this webinar today. And then if you are attending the walking tour this afternoon, we are also offering one credit for that as well. Uh, so that's all I have to say, and I will turn it over to Erica Harris. Thank you, Ben, and good morning, everyone. We're so excited to talk to you about Stormwater Parks. Um, we've got a great lineup for you. Um, my name is Erica Harris. I'm a planner at Puget Sound Regional Council. In case this is uh, uh, your first PSRC meeting, uh, PSRC is the regional planning agency for the four county central Puget Sound region. So that's Snohomish, King, Pierce and Kitsap counties. Um, but we hope this um, presentation is actually um, you know, relevant to, to anyone really throughout the country. Um, at a very high level, in case you don't know, stormwater parks are community facilities that have both stormwater management and recreation. And I'll get into more of the details in a little bit. So I'll provide an introduction and show you some examples of stormwater parks that have already been built. And you'll hear from Bethany Stedman. She is a project manager and engineer at AHBL. She'll tell you about the stormwater parks that they're working on, as well as some guidance that we're developing. You'll hear from Jenny Gauss, the uh, Surface Water Strategic Advisor from the city of Kirkland. Uh, they also have a couple of stormwater parks that they're working on, so you, you'll hear about her. And then Michelle Perdue from Kitsap County, We'll tell you about all the different stormwater parks that they're working on and the ones that they've already built. So uh, Michelle is the, uh, the stormwater program manager there. So what are stormwater parks and why are they important? Um, so of course they provide recreation, but um, I think most of you know how important recreation and access to Green space is important to health and community. Um, so I probably don't need to go through that a lot, but um, that's that, that health aspect that we're trying to encourage. We, we need more parks in our, our cities, especially as we are experiencing population growth. We also, Vision 2050 also has a policy on 
providing equitable access to parks. I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the stormwater piece um, because we have kind of a more specific uh, definition. Uh, stormwater parks are regional stormwater retrofit facilities. Regional facility meaning it uh, treats water or, or manages water, I should say, from um, a larger than the site. So it could be a basin, a neighborhood, it could be hundreds of acres. Um, so we really see this as an important strategy in Puget Sound recovery. Uh, you, a lot of you probably know that stormwater is the major contributor to pollution in Puget Sound and our salmon and orcas are not doing well. So we need to do all we can to save them. And these, these are a, a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, so, um, and retrofit is means that, that it's fixing a problem from the past. So a lot of our previous development has not um, had stormwater controls that are up to the current standard. So it's able to, a facility like this is able to fix those um, stormwater issues. So when addressed, um, when built in areas not served by parks, uh, stormwater parks can help address equity. We hear more about that later. Stormwater parks also support tribal treaty rights. Um, salmon recovery is very important to our tribes and these help with that. When built in a, a park um, with natural features, a stormwater park um, can provide wildlife habitat that wasn't there before. Um, so uh, we've heard that residents around those parks really enjoy the bird watching that happens with parks um, with constructed wetlands, for example. Um, and stormwater parks are really a multidisciplinary um, project. More Multiple uh, departments are involved, um, which makes it a little complex, um, but that also means that there are also multiple funding sources that are available. So we've heard that could be very helpful. So a little more on this multidisciplinary approach. I'm really excited that this group um, is multidisciplinary. I've noticed from the registration, there are folks from parks, from stormwater, from planning, um, really a lot of um, different disciplines that all do need to come together to make these stormwater parks successful. So I'm glad to see this and hopefully you'll share this with your colleagues. Um, the, the webinar will be recorded, so there'll be opportunity to look at it later, as well as the presentation. So um, some advantages of putting together a multidisciplinary team for this um, is that, of course, it can help with the joint planning of stormwater, and that's critical, um, especially with uh, maintenance. That, that can be a real roadblock if it's not thought about early. Um, a lot of you are experts in community engagement and might uh, talk to the community at different times. So coming together, you can discuss what you've heard from the community um, so that they're not having to tell you multiple times uh, what they would like in, in a park. And as far as um, comprehensive plans and functional plans, those, um, you know, having this team come together can really um, have, help with that integration. And then uh, working together, um, we've heard that helps to identify opportunities for new stormwater parks. So because stormwater parks are such an important uh, strategy for Puget Sound recovery, uh, PSRC received a National Estuary Program grant to promote stormwater parks. The first part of the project was to share lessons learned from already built stormwater parks. We have profiles from uh, several stormwater parks on our stormwater parks webpage. I'll show you those in a moment. Um, so please check those out. And, and we have heard that um, stormwater parks aren't necessarily a new thing, but they are not really um, kind of built to scale. We, we could have a lot more stormwater parks in the region. Possibly the reason why is because they're a little more complex since they do require working across departments. So um, we're hoping that these lessons learned that we're sharing will kind of help um, with that planning. The second part of the project is to provide technical assistance for the planning of uh, six new stormwater parks. And you'll hear uh, later from our guests uh, about that and how that's going. The last part is to de develop a guidance document on planning stormwater parks. Uh, Bethany will cover that a little bit more. We hope to have that ready in the next couple of months. 
So I'll show you a number of uh, stormwater park examples. These are ones that have already been built. Um, one thing I wanted to be clear is a stormwater park can be created by uh, putting together a new facility with both the stormwater and uh, recreation, but it could also be uh, adding a stormwater facility onto a park that's already been built, maybe during a major renovation. Or a third option is to add recreation to a stormwater facility. So there are a lot of different ways to get these stormwater parks created and a lot of, a lot of opportunity. So this stormwater park is in the city of Arlington. It's, their, uh, wet, it's a constructed wetland and it treats the 280 acre basin of Old Town Arlington. Um, Old Town Arlington did not have stormwater treatment before. So um, it's a big um, improvement for that area and to the Stil Stiligamish River. It has trails, wildlife viewing, a dog park. It also provides public access to the Stil Stiligamish River. This stormwater park in the city of Bellevue is actually one of the older stormwater parks. It was built when uh, the developer um, developed the neighborhood and the city of Bellevue asked them to build this park. So it was completely funded by the developer. Um, it's a large park, has a lot of amenities, play areas, trails, picnic shelters, tennis courts, um, a, lot of other, a lot of other great facilities for the community. And the drainage basin area is 215 acres. I won't go into Kitsap County's Manchester Stormwater Park because you'll hear about that from Michelle, but uh, I just wanted to um, thank Kitsap County for being such a leader in stormwater parks. You've, if you've heard about a stormwater park, it's probably this one. It's very beautiful. The city of Paulsbo uh, created a stormwater park um, through their development uh, with Quadrant Homes. And uh, Quadrant Homes completely paid for the stormwater park um, as part of their development agreement. It provides trails uh, right next to the new development. The city of Seattle's Madison Valley Stormwater Improvements is actually uh, two, two parks, um, two different sites. And uh, each one provides some, some different things, but um, certainly trails and play areas and both. Um, and this park is a little different than the others because it was um, primarily uh, done for flood flooding and to alleviate that problem. Um, stormwater parks can take care of flooding or treatment or both, but this one was primarily for flooding. The city of Shoreline, when they did a major renovation of Cromwell, park added a constructed wetland. Again, this helped with flooding for the nearby neighborhood, um, but also it does provide treatment. Um, and the neighbors really appreciate the, um, the birding that's now available in the park. It has trails that run through it and around it as well. The City of Seattle and Metro Parks Tacoma partnered to build this facility at the entrance of Point Defiance Park. It treats over 750 acres from the uphill basin, and it's only 5,500 square feet. So it treats a lot of stormwater in a very small area. Now this stormwater park, Tanner Springs Park in the city of Portland, um, obviously is not in the region, but a lot of people really love this park. And I wanted to kind of show you what a, an ultra urban stormwater park could look like. Um, you can see it's kind of almost more of a plaza and this is in Portland's Pearl District. A couple of other lovely stormwater parks um, that incorporate, incorporate a lot of art. Uh, one on the left is in China, and the one on the right is in Illinois. I encourage you to, to go to our website and, and click on the link that you'll see there, um, especially the one in China. There are some gorgeous photos of this particular stormwater park, very inspirational. So I'll share a few lessons learned from the development of these uh, stormwater parks that have already been built. Um, when they are well sited and designed, they can achieve multiple benefits, really beyond some of the benefits that I've already highlighted. When uh, 
departments come together, they can uh, they can really you know put together a nice stormwater park that meets all of their needs. Um, but also, they can help each other find new opportunities for stormwater parks, whether it's on uh, you know public land or looking at uh, private property, because that's also an option. Uh, Public engagement is, is critical and it can help lead to greater acceptance of the project and also to a, a better design. Uh, having a project champion and, and political support, um, I've heard is very helpful. Um, so I know that a lot of your elected officials who heard the Stormwater Parks presentation at the Growth Management Policy Board meeting yesterday are very excited about it. So I think you'll find some support there. Maintenance obviously is important in the project design and uh, bringing in your maintenance person early in and to kind of address some of those issues um, is very helpful. We know that our weather patterns are changing so factoring climate change into design is going to be more and more important. And then sort of a high level takeaway is that because these stormwater parks uh, vary so much in size and function even in cost, um, there are a lot of opportunities to put stormwater parks throughout the region. So I wanted to, oops, sorry, I went a little too far. Um, these are the criteria we use to um, select the jurisdictions to receive technical assistance for stormwater parks. Um, we did receive uh, quite a few applications and had to, to choose the ones that we thought would be most uh, successful and provide the most benefit. Um, we appreciate everyone who did submit um, for technical assistance. Um, but I'm sharing this mostly because uh, it might give you an idea of some of the criteria you might look at if you wanted to select sites for stormwater parks in your jurisdiction. Um, if you want to uh, help with the uh, park gaps um, and the need for equitable access, you could look at that as criteria. Uh, I think most parks, recreation, and open space plans have information on their park gaps and in the, in, uh, those. But let me know if you have any questions about that. Uh, salmon and water quality benefit is, of course, important. And you can think of that in terms of, is there a um, salmon bearing stream nearby? But also, how big is that um, basin? And where are you within the basin? Uh, most stormwater parks need to be fairly low in the basin. Uh, to be effective. So uh, pollutant loading is also something to think about uh, if you happen to be in an area with not a lot of roads or other um, places that pollute, uh, maybe that's not the best place for a stormwater park. However, unfortunately, most places do have a fairly high level of pollutant loading that are urban in the region. Of course, community engagement and support is critical. And we, we actually got letters um, in our applications to show support for these stormwater parks. And we looked at public land ownership because of the short-term nature of this project. But if you wanted to take a longer term look at what your potential are, you could kind of look at a, um, an acquisition strategy and you might find that um, some of the best locations um, still need to be acquired. And I should mention too that um, you can also incentivize uh, private property owners to put stormwater parks on their property, um, especially some of those larger uh, commercial buildings. And um, there's some good examples of that around the region, such as the, um, the uh, development under the Aurora Bridge. So uh, I mentioned the guidance document that will be posted uh, on our stormwater parks webpage and the website is right there. And now I will pass it on to Bethany. We'll stop sharing my Great. screen. Yeah. And I will start sharing my screen here. All right, so I am the civil engineer that was working with Puget Sound Regional Council for planning for stormwater parks and um, some of the steps that we took was to first, um, when we kicked off our meetings with the jurisdictions, we wanted to assemble an interdisciplinary project team. It's really important really early on to be able to hear from all uh, person, 
all different groups that will be associated with the park. So parks department, public works, any maintenance and operations personnel to flesh out, you know, what is the goals of the site? What is reasonable systems that we can implement on each site? We needed to integrate equity. So um, in our this respect, we had selected jurisdictions who had sites that had gaps in the open spaces for um, providing equity to the community. But also, if we are engaging the community, we need to think about equity as well. Uh, not in, in this day and age, we're doing a lot of virtual opportunities, but uh, also having in-person opportunities for those who may be disenfranchised for access to technology. Um, and then we had selected the sites when we were selecting the jurisdictions, but if you're selecting a site, you know, you want to integrate equity into that site selection, but also include the stormwater component. Erica had mentioned it, picking a site kind of low in the basin. We want a site that is has enough area draining to it. So we're not looking for something at the top of a hill. We're looking at for something that is closer to the discharge before it goes into a creek or other basins so that it captures enough area to really provide enough water quality benefit. Um, and then part of my job is to develop alternatives and design approaches. This is something that ecology and other grant fund um, participants are really interested in making sure that we're picking the right alternative concept for the value of the project, but also that we're also providing the correct alternatives for the community as well. Each community is going to be very unique. Some are going to be looking for passive recreation. Others will be looking for active recreation. Um, it will go back into equity. You know, what are the other amenities available in that community? We don't want to overlap those opportunities, but provide them new opportunities. And so the stormwater concepts may change based on the park opportunities that we're also looking to implement. The next step is also funding sources. So we, in our guidance document, we're going to provide a resource for um, how, where to go for different grant applications um, and different funding sources. There's also not just grant opportunities, but we've also identified some private um, donors that have been involved in helping with equity in parks. And th so the next step for our jurisdictions, we provided some preliminary concepts, preliminary cost modeling, and the next steps for them is to go after those funding sources and eventually get to um, have a project that is designed and go into construction. So now I'm going to go over a few. Oh, these are a few of our lessons learned. And the rendering to the right, um, Jenny may recognize, it's 132nd Square Park in the city of Kirkland. It's in construction right now. It's a very large infiltration facility that treats 40 acres of upstream area under an athletic field. So one of the um, lessons learned on that project, as well as the projects that I'm going to show you, is to bring stakeholders to the early meetings to really flesh out what strategies you're going to implement. Um, for instance, you know, our maintenance team may have um, some pretty strong opinions on what they can comfortably maintain, what is um, acceptable materials in their jurisdiction. Um, we want to confirm goals with all the stakeholders. We want to make sure Parks has representation at the table so that they can talk about their comfort level with different maintenance um, issues and as well as the facilities that are going to be proposed to the community. We want to, so I talked about that, confirm the acceptable solutions for an um, operation maintenance. We want to allow for float time in our schedule. You know, scheduling can be um, challenging and getting everyone at the table at the same time. I've also seen that the community engagement process can sometimes take more time than expected. And then also confirming that the project meets the definition for the grants that you're receiving. We had a couple applicants that we were getting really excited about and then realized it was more of a stream restoration project and it didn't meet the grant 
definition for a stormwater project. I, stream restoration projects are absolutely a valuable project, but as a civil engineer, I can't put element stormwater solutions in line with streams. So we had to kind of change our strategy on one of those projects um, because it wasn't meeting the grant application definition. And now I'm gonna go into a few of the projects that we provided technical assistance on. So the first one is City of Linwood. This one is an interesting project. It was an existing mini park that was actually a also a pond. So it was a pond built for a short plat and then they built a park in the footprint of the pond. And so during about 40 months out of the year, that park is flooded because it's in the bottom of a pond. There's also a lot of accessibility issues. They have three to one side slopes down into the pond. So you can imagine that, and it's grassed. So you can imagine that it's kind of challenging for all users to be able to access that playground equipment. The playground equipment is aging as well. And so with this one, we decided to go below grade with our system. We wanted to make a, an accessible park that wasn't flooding. And so now with the system being below grade in chambers, the whole park has raised up to the elevation of the surrounding streets, creating more accessible routes, creating more trail opportunities, and the playground will no longer be flooding. And this is treating about 20 acres of upstream area. It's increasing the, not just the volume being provided, but also uh, it never had water quality treatment. So we added that component to the project. Our next one is Marysville. This is a different, very different project in that it's 118 acres of upstream area going to a very large park. There's a creek at, in the middle of the park. There's wetlands all around the creek and they already have a lot of amenities. They have a parking lot and a playground and they're receiving lots of grants and projects to increase the value of this park. So this one, we were much more focused on the stormwater system and um, having an above grade system that can be used for educational purposes. So this is a, um, in the upper, upper part of the map, this is an existing stormwater facility that isn't really functioning as intended. And we plan on re, planting it as more of a wetland and also providing biopods, which are a rain garden with proprietary uh, soils. So it has a much smaller footprint than a bioretention cell, but it's very similar to like a rain garden. It's planted in the same manner and will be providing boardwalks. So part of it was that this existing stormwater facility is kind of in the backyard back of mind, it has had a lot of um, illegal dumping and other unattractive um, activities happening. And so we're gonna be building some boardwalks and trails that go around it and making it more of an amenity for the park, having interpretive signage. Um, so that is, and the second component of this project is that there's going to be a vault in the parking lot. It's shown off to the side, but it's actually going to be in the parking lot. So there's both above grade and below grade opportunities happening at the site. So this one for Pialuk, we are looking at a basin of 700 acres. This one, the, the vast majority of that acreage is going through a stream. So we were unable to capture that much area but we identified 13 acres of area coming off of the existing roadways. And this one was one where we had a lot of discussions with public works. They were very interested in doing water quality treatment for those roads in the park. Their original concepts was fire retention cells and having a bunch of trails going through the parks. We later met with parks and they had a lot of concerns with that. Um, partly encampments in the parks. They didn't want to open a lot of the very heavily vegetated areas to the public. They wanted to keep them closer to the roads and where there's a lot of eyes on the public. And so, and then the other 
uh, thing that they identified a need for was more parking. They have two very large athletic fields that do not have sufficient parking. And so we looked at adding 58 parking stalls, providing bioretention cells between those parking stalls so that that gives you the educational opportunities um, and public engagement with those stormwater resources and then having a cascading uh, bioretention cells in this plot of area, which parks help us identify, um, they had some unhealthy trees in that area that need to come down. And so they thought that this was a great opportunity to replant that with bioretention cells and revegetate in that manner. Um, so this, and I think that is, oh, and then we have one more, we have Woodenville. So this one is an existing park that has some, um, aging assets. So they have a very old tennis court that they identified as not being used as a tennis court anymore. It's been used for kids uh, on their bikes, you know, smaller kids or as an off-leash park, um, letting the dogs run around. They have an aging basketball court and a very small parking lot. This site had um, it has Wooden Creek running along the east side with about four wetlands mapped along that creek. And so we needed to make sure we were staying outside of the limits of that creek. Um, they brought in a very robust team at the very beginning that with their planning department, their maintenance department and parks so that they were able to identify all of the goals of the park and also um, things for us to keep in mind as we started developing. And what we decided with this one, this one was hard to provide something above grade because the pipe was so low in the system already. So to daylight that system that would require a lot of um, excavation. And we decided that that wasn't giving us the best value for the park as well as for water quality treatment. We're right there at the level of the Sammamish River. So there's some challenges as we get down, you know, not just not having enough hit, um, fall across the site for um, providing something like bioretention cells or biopods. So we went below grade with a modular wetland. And this gives an opportunity for them to have more active recreation above grade. We show them some concepts of a striped bike park in uh, White Center where it's just a paved surface and it's for younger kids. So it's a flat surface that's pa uh, painted to look like roads with little stop signs and stop bars so that the kids can pretend to be cars. And they really, that kind of resonated with them. You know, the users of the park was already using the tennis court for that purpose. So. We also um, are providing some pickleball courts and they're actually planning on um, entering the community engagement process. So a lot of these concepts could change, but um, those were some of the things that they were interested in. This is treating 122 acres of upstream area um, in this footprint of this existing park. And so there is my contact information, which will be included in the presentation that gets uploaded. And I am passing the screen on to Jenny. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you. Go ahead and share. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the North Rose Hill open space. And then I have lessons learned that are based on um, one other stormwater park that Kirkland has built and one that we have done some planning for but have not yet built. So, so first, why did we choose uh, the North Rose Hill Park to be part of the PSRC project? Um, it was on the park side, we looked at the 2015 Parks Recreation and Open Space Plan, 
and found that there was a gap in park space provided in the North Coast Hill area. And so this, this park sits right at the edge of that area. So we thought that would be a good spot. Uh, in addition, this park is directly in line with a, a proposed um, portion of a citywide trail system that runs north south through the site. So I thought it would be nice to be able to connect and build one more part of that trail. Jenny, I, I'm seeing your uh, note slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if other people are, but yeah, okay. If you just swap. Apologies, I didn't realize I need to do that each time. So, okay. Uh, and then on the stormwater side, uh, we had done quite a bit of planning in this area. Uh, we received a National Estuary Program grant uh, administered by the Department of Ecology uh, to study and plan for uh, retrofits in the Northwest Hill area. And um, we were interested in that area uh, from the stormwater side because we found that it produced a lot more flow relative to its area than other portions of the Fort Creek Basin. And the development in that area is largely single family residential, meaning that it won't redevelop in a way that will require um, stormwater controls. And so we had gone through a process with Jacobs uh, to identify sites and do a little bit of, mostly from the stormwater side, public engagement, looking at where we could put these things. Um, and this site was one of our top sites. Uh, it does drain to Forbes Creek, which has uh, some flooding problems at 405 and Northeast 116th Street and has uh, multiple water quality impairments. And again, it's uh, the area that drains to it is 18 acres and it's 18 acres of area that's not likely to redevelop. Uh, we also were interested in this site because from initial soil maps, it looked like it might infiltrate uh, and so we could get you know, a lot of water into a fairly limited area and get some flow control as well as some water quality. And again, this is just showing the upstream area of about 18 acres of existing residential area. Um, so some specifics about the site itself. Uh, it, it's kind of an interesting site because it's really a blank slate. Um, which is unusual in Kirkland. We're a very dense community that's largely built out. Um, the parks that we do have are either active recreation, recreation or often they have extremely dense, very nice trees on them. And so we don't want to start busting down trees to put in stormwater facilities. Um, so this one was, was, we looked at it and was like, wow, this is kind of a nice blank slate. It's currently just overrun with invasive plants. It doesn't have any big trees. Um, there are some private property encroachments, which are an issue. The folks here, here, and over here view this park as, as part of their backyard. Um, so that's something that when you know, this moves forward, we will have to definitely work carefully. Uh, our parks department says that they are very willing to do that, um, that as long as they are given plenty of time, because they find that it can take almost, say, two years to get encroachments handled in a way that um, that is sort of satisfying to all parties. So um, there is a rockery on the northern portion and sort of a drop off, um, uh, something that we need to be aware of if we're ponding water here, we don't want to endanger the, you know, don't cause a slide into this parking lot. Um, we have a storm line running right through the middle of our site that happens to be in terrible shape. And so we need to replace it anyway. So that was really a, a we see this as a great opportunity to um, you know, fix that storm line as well as making an, a stormwater park. Um, there is a Seattle City Light easement that runs over this entire park. Uh, you'll see in the photos that there's some large towers. Um, and so we have to be mindful of their needs for uh, safety of the power lines and maintain, maintenance of the power lines. So things like no tall trees, um, they're very leery of standing water. So we'll have to talk to them about our proposed design and make sure that they're, they're okay with that. Um, and again, there's an existing uh, interest in a citywide trail. The condo uh, development right to the south uh, did build a portion of that trail when they developed just a few years ago. And so we want to connect to that, that's right here. Um, and then our access to the site is some, another something that we'll have to consider. It's currently via a private street. Uh, and an easement. So we would need, and this is the only vehicle access. There's uh, this panhandle to the east is quite steep. And so pedestrians use it, but vehicles cannot. 
and these are just some pictures. Again, it's really a blank slate. There's just not a lot going on there right now. So we, we saw this as a really nice opportunity to provide sort of a neighborhood level park. So when we worked uh, with AHBL uh, through this process, um, we were super excited to have sort of the opportunity to dream a little bit using the PSRC um, project and funds. And we tried to think of things that would help us really get some, some tools that would help us move this forward. And so uh, after talking with our parks department and our stormwater folks and our maintenance folks, we decided that we'd like to do some geotechnical evaluation to see if infiltration actually works, um, to get some topographic survey so that we could really do a design that we knew would work, uh, and then to do some preliminary engineering and landscape design and cost estimating. Um, so that again, we'd be sort of ready to look for funding sources to go to full design and construction. And we found uh, through these things that indeed uh, infiltration actually was not feasible, um, which is a great thing to find out early. We've had other projects where we've, we've gone pretty far in the design, assuming that the maps were correct and that we could get infiltration, found out that wasn't the case. So it was great to find out in this case early that infiltration would not be feasible. And so that pointed us to more of a biofiltration water quality treatment uh, as opposed to flow control. Um, so that was super helpful. And what we found as far as the park and the opportunity was that we could provide uh, biotension, so water quality treatment for 18 acres of upstream area. We could extend that existing trail. In, park, in talking with our parks department, they really wanted a sort of a loop setup as opposed to just like take the trail straight through. And so we, we tried to incorporate that in the design. Um, we talked with our maintenance folks quite a bit about what they would need to be able to get in to take care of uh, bioretention. And so they wanted um, vehicle access. And so I believe our trails are wide enough that we can provide access to get to all the different portions of the biofiltration. Uh, there would be uh, an overlook in the north edge that would have some benches, uh, benches designed to the parks department uh, specs, so again, so that they're maintainable, they can keep those items in their inventory, they're easy to change out if need be, uh, and then use um, the overlook as an opportunity for education and that we would add some interpretive signage. And then uh, finally, our parks department had identified this as a site where they really wanted uh, pollinators, uh, plants that encourage pollinators. And so uh, as the design moves forward, we would incorporate uh, low shrubs in order to handle the overhead power, but also shrubs that encourage pollinators. So some of our lessons learned again from this project and from other stormwater parks, 132nd Square and some other parks in Kirkland that we have designed but not built um, is really to let parks lead. Um, the parks, recreation, and open space plans have so much public engagement. They do so much to talk to the public and engage them. Um, and so they, they sort of have their marching orders in that prose plan. And so the stormwater pieces on some level need to uh, really fit in with that. Um, in Kirkland, we are very land constrained. There aren't a lot of opportunities to, to go build a stormwater park and then to give it to the parks department. So we're really working with what, um, what parks already has planned. And uh, along those same lines, you have to be nimble. Um, we had originally identified this site based on the 2015 PROS plan. Uh, the city uh, was in the process of and just finished their new PROS plan. Um, this site actually does not Come out as a priority in the new pros plan. So now we have to be a little bit nimble and figure out um, what we do about that. Um, so to, to let parks lead and work with their priorities as much as possible. Um, on the same, and then on the stormwater side, I would say to the thing that really helps is to be ready with opportunities to, to really do the stormwater piece of, you know, where do we need stormwater parks, you know, and, and in a perfect storm, it all lines up. That, that's what happened with our 132nd Square project. We got, you know, we identified that through a stormwater planning process and then got a little bit lucky in that the city wanted some artificial turf fields at that park uh, and were able to sort of combine forces um, 
I'd say on that one, we, we didn't initially let parks lead. Um, there was quite a scramble to do a master plan for that park. Um, the parks department was maybe a little unhappy with us stormwater people because that was really a lot of work for them. Uh, it's, it's turning out to be a great project in the end. Um, but I think if we could start with the parks and, and honor the fact that they need to do their master planning process, that would be very helpful. So, but, you know, again, have the stormwater priorities ready um, and, and really be ready to jump and ready to be nimble when, when opportunities do arise. Um, again, getting that early geotech information is super, super helpful. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, know if infiltration will work. Uh, again, we are a very land constrained community. And so whenever we can do infiltration, we want to, uh, both for flow control and water quality and because it's just super space efficient. And so know that geotechnical information as early as possible. And then uh, more of just a musing uh, on the funding, which is if we could start to advocate for park and stormwater funding sources that are matched, um, that might interest our parks in, department in, you know, especially if we can add money for doing that master planning process, uh, we might get more stormwater parks by, by doing that. So uh, again, I'm Jenny Gauss. I'm with the city of Kirkland. There's my contact information. And now I will turn it over to Michelle with Kitsap County. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. I will. Get us set up here with share screen. Okay. Are you, let's see here. Okay. I'm presuming you guys are seeing the correct slides. So let me know if not. Um, I'm Michelle Perdue. Thanks for the intro. Um, I'm with Kitsap County and stormwater parks, you know, while they feel like they've been with us at the county for quite some time, you know, really are a, a new thing for us. Um, a number of years ago, you know, we were probably in the same position that a lot of jurisdictions are in, where we were mostly treating drainage solutions. You know, we we were responding to fires, basically. We were taking care of flooding. We were trying to do a little bit of thinking ahead, but really, you know, we were focusing mostly on the issue at hand. Um, and right about uh, around 2009, the county and a really forward thinking group of county commissioners adopted what we call our water as a resource policy. And basically what that says is that the county is going to commit to treating our runoff, our water as a resource and, you know, not a waste stream. So that really triggered a big change in philosophy for us in stormwater. And, and that was a move from just addressing these drainage situations to really, you know, doing a more holistic approach to creating some solutions for sustainable growth. And some of the ways that, you know, this played out was um, we started a, a bigger focus on green stormwater infrastructure. So, you know, whereas everything had been previously focused mostly on our gray, you know, this move to green stormwater infrastructure took us in a direction of, you know, trying to get us more back in line with natural function as, as best we could. And paired with that, you know, was this approach of, you know, rather than seeing just the problem in, in one little focal area, to do more of this watershed and community-based planning. Because what we began to see was that, you know, we could, we could apply some of these solutions, and if we applied enough of them in a watershed, you know, we would reach, you know, more of a critical mass towards water quality in the end. And the direction that eventually led us, you know, as you might imagine, is to looking at these multifunctional and multi-benefit stormwater systems. So, you know, if you are looking for something that really gives you the most bang for your buck, these multi-benefit stormwater systems really are it. Because you can take 
one parcel and make it do multiple duties. So it became evident, you know, right away to, you know, some of our thought leaders that this might be the good direction to move. So, you know, what really is so important about these projects? You know, you guys have heard, you know, a lot of different takes on that through the course of this presentation, and I'm going to repeat a little bit of that. But, you know, what it boils down to is new construction really gets all the love. You get to choose what you put there, and it's designed to the latest standards to be protective of water quality just by nature. But what happens in those fully built out, built out environments to try to bring those locations back around to water quality protection? Well, these retrofits really are the key to that. What we found is they return a whole lot of value. You know, not only are they taking care of what's already there, but by applying these retrofits, these are the ways that we really move the needle for water quality, both in our local waterways, streams, as well as Puget Sound. And really, it's it's putting back a lot of that watershed function that's been lost to development over the years, where, you know, those functions were once, you know, 100 years ago, you know, 200 years ago, these were vegetated areas, you know, the, the forests were acting like a sponge to handle all of the runoff, then we built everything out. So, you know, how do we put back that watershed function? Well, these retrofits really move the bar in that direction. So, you know, it, it does, again, move beyond just that drainage piece. What we're getting when we do these is a, is a lot of environmental benefits, like, you know, obviously the water quality treatment and flow control. But, you know, when we're doing things that are more naturalized, we can also be putting back wildlife habitat, you know, that's been lost to development, or maybe, you know, that wasn't in this area for a while. Um, we are putting back education and outreach opportunities. So whether that's like you see there with some interpretive signage or whether that's creating areas for um, educational outreach, you know, in this park location, that that brings back people more in contact with you know the environmental concepts that we're trying to get across um, it's community amenities like active and passive recreation a lot of our facilities have walk paths and picnic benches and places that you can sit and eat places that you can bird watch you know i mean all of these pieces that you know you know, may not be able to find in other locations or that wouldn't normally be associated with a stormwater facility. And then finally, you know, the community benefits to us are, are the really big ones. So obviously, you know, you, you have the choice between putting in a pipe and a pond or you can put in a stormwater park. And, you know, I mean, one of those may be more aesthetically pleasing to, you know, the community than others. Um, we find that these facilities often give a sense of place so they can be destinations on their own. And obviously, we know that contact with nature is beneficial for human health. So, you know, we are creating these little oases, you know, in in some respects in areas that don't already have them to reintroduce some of the natural spaces in places maybe where these these have been lost that connection has been lost. So a little bit of history here. Uh, I know Erica showed you a really beautiful photo way back in the beginning of the presentation of our Manchester stormwater park. I'll give you a little bit of history of this one because this was our first official foray into stormwater parks. So what you don't see in these pictures here is that our little community of Manchester, which sits basically on the eastern side of Kitsap County, that has a beautiful view of downtown Seattle and the skyline. Um, they had a little bit of a problem down there. We had an outfall that you see down in the bottom right corner that needed replacing. And we didn't have any any stormwater treatment in this area that outfall discharged about 100 acres worth of runoff directly to Puget Sound direct, directly out to their beautiful water body with no treatment. So we had this this lot that you see there on the left 
Originally, when we got there, it had a little shack on it, leftovers from um, basically the old town, Manchester. Um, it had been vacant for some time. It was a little bit of an eyesore. That corner that you see sits right down in the middle of their downtown area. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely a focal point. It's attached right there to this beautiful beach and this beautiful view. And we thought, okay, well, we can go in there and we can get them, we, we can get some stormwater treatment here. We'll put in a pond and we'll replace this outfall. And we proposed that and the community said, oh no, we definitely don't want this. You know, this is not fitting our, our view of ourselves as a community. We, we definitely do not want you to go that direction. Um, and so we had to take this project back to the drawing board. Um, we had a really highly involved community in this area. So there are advantages and disadvantages with that. And, and I'll get a little bit more into that as we go on. So back to the drawing board, we went with this project. We knew we didn't want it to be just a pond with a fence around it and an outfall repair. So we went back to the community and we did a deep dive with them. We sat down with them at their community meetings. We did a bunch of presentations to them. We did a walk with them all along the development of this entire project. And one of the most impactful things that I remember as we went through this project was a design charrette where we came in as the county we had a couple of ideas that we'd surveyed from them earlier that they told us about that they were interested in for the look and the feel down there. We came back in with a whole bunch of mood boards, sat down with the community at the community group, and they did a dot exercise and they told us exactly the things that they thought were valuable down in this in this parcel. And in the end, if you look up at the right hand diagram up there, there are 17 different elements on here that the community directly selected that we were able to work into the final design. So, you know, for us, this was a really big cutting edge project at that time. It was a learning experience for everybody. But what happened in the long run is that by including the community alongside us, and being that active partner and having those sideboards to say, okay, here are some things that we can do. Here are some things that we absolutely can't do. So these are off the table, but we have an open slate and we need your input. We work those into those final designs and this, this park is used on a continual basis. So I can tell you that every time we go down there, there is somebody, there's a dog walker, there's a picnicker, there's a family kicking a ball around, there's a farmer's market, there's some sort of event happening in this park. So the community has really embraced this location once, once we got it installed. Um, we had the advantage with this project, you know, of, of walking through and making those mistakes for the first time and, and evolving. This helped us build some staff skills and knowledge and by coming out with this fabulous product in the end that was a win for both the county and the community it built a lot of public support not just for stormwater parks in general but it built a lot of of credibility and um and love for county projects in general so that was definitely a win and some of these photos here show you just a little bit about, you know, the different things that I've been talking about with this park. Um, up on the top left, you'll see our bioretention cells. That's the stormwater function to this particular park. Those cells run all the way around the outside. But what you'll also see is that there's a lot of green space in the middle, and that is all by design. It's open for public access. So whatever they want to do out there, we made this open space for them. That was something we heard really clearly. Um, what we noticed that they're using that for now is things like their flea market. They've got a, a flea market that runs throughout the summer. They've got, you see, you know, up on the right hand side, the banner for the flea market. They've got a 4th of July celebration that happens down there. 
Um, kind of a funny aside that we heard along the way while we were working with the community group out there was, you know, we were almost all the way to the complete build and they said, hey, you know, we think it'd be really cool to have a Christmas tree out here. We'd like to do a Christmas tree lighting. So we actually built into the middle of that park a, a flap with a hole in the ground, basically that their Christmas tree sets down into and a plug in for the Christmas tree lighting. So that's become a new tradition for them. Um, the other thing that we heard from them pretty strongly as we went through the design process was, okay, this was a vacant lot at one time. You could see a lot of things that were happening out there. You know, the, the sight lines were good, but also they were afraid that once we built something in there that it was gonna become a spot for vandalism or you know people that weren't doing things that they wanted them to be doing. So they had some security concerns. Um, so they asked us for some lighting for safety and aesthetics. So we did place some lights all the way around the edge of the park, overhead lighting. But, you know, we also integrated that for aesthetics and for safety purposes into some of the elements. So what you see down there in that left corner is our spiral rain garden. And that at night is lit up all the way around the outside. It provides kind of a nice view. It allows you to see what's going on even there at night. And it provides some ambient light for the area, as well as over on that right hand lower picture. There's a wave design over the top of the benches. That's actually, if you look where the wave and the light is, that is the back edge of those bioretention cells. And we've got some safety and aesthetic lighting there as well. So armed with that knowledge and the success that we had out at Manchester, as well as another one that we, we put in in the meantime that was also fairly successful, we came up with this new candidate project. Um, we were very fortunate and very grateful to have received that grant from PSRC for preliminary and design and feasibility on this project. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So what you can see there where the arrow is pointing is the park site and that is in downtown Silverdale. It's a county owned parcel that's currently vacant, um, not quite an acre, but it's got a pretty large drainage basin over here of residential. Um, that's about 72 and a half acres. Well, previously, all of this drainage basin drained down to Dyes Inlet. That is our vulnerable impaired water body and also one of our priority watersheds from our planning efforts. So we thought that this was in a really great spot. It had really good advantages, you know, for gaining some water quality in this location. Um, a couple of the other advantages for this particular location is we had existing adjacent stormwater utilities. So, you know, we've got pipes that run right by right on the main street there pretty easy to connect to. That was a big advantage. It's also got connectivity to our existing trail and the non-motorized system, which passes right by on those streets. Um, as you can see, you know, from this aerial here, it's adjacent to all of these residential areas, but then also the commercial core. So it is that transition zone that kind of splits the difference between those two, which felt like a really good spot for something like this. And finally, you know, a, a plan for a stormwater park like this really fit in with our comprehensive plan and our Silverdale design standards goals, you know, in ways that that look a lot like designing streetscapes to include environmenting, inviting urban environments that support a variety of uses or considering health and equity impacts on vulnerable populations when locating facilities. So it was just really hitting on all of these really good points. So we were very excited for the opportunity to work with PSRC on this particular project. One of the first things that we looked at when we looked at this as a project site was environmental equity. You know, this is a big thing and something that, you know, we hadn't previously taken into consideration very often, frankly. Um, we are definitely moving that direction. Um, Kitsap has in the last year created what we call our Kitsap County Equity Atlas. 
and that pulls data sets from housing and urban development, CDC, EPA, Department of Health, and more to tell us really about where our overburdened communities are, where our, our challenging areas are, as well as where we feel like our opportunities are. And one of the exciting things that we found when we looked at this project site in conjunction with that was that this site is actually located in the, the most diverse area of unincorporated Kitsap County. So what that means is it's within a one mile radius of five out of the top eight most diverse census tracts in unincorporated Kitsap. And then all of our top eight most diverse census tracts are located within a two mile radius. So that was pretty exciting for us because we felt like these were communities that we may not have served very well and that that could be really benefiting from a location like this. There's also no parks nearby in any of these neighborhoods. So again, this was hitting on a lot of beats that we wanted to hit on. So again, learning from our Manchester project and some of the other projects we've done in between about the benefit of really getting the community involved early and often and finding out what they want, what they need, you know, what they'd like to see. Um, we went out to the community with a survey and we said, hey, tell us about it. So this is a word cloud that tells you a little bit about, you know, what the community told us. And so some of the key things, you know, that we saw in here were actually some of the same things that we'd been thinking, which, you know, was pretty gratifying, but, you know, also very doable. So, you know, you can see in there that they're, they're thinking about open space. They're thinking about trees. This particular lot has a lot of existing mature trees on it. And we heard very clearly when we surveyed the community that they valued those and they wanted to keep some of those. So, you know, that, that emerged from that process. You see things like walking paths, benches, vegetation, all definitely doable things in the context of a stormwater park. So we felt like we were definitely going the right direction. So with that, um, we went back with AHBL and, and PSRC and said, okay, now what are we gonna do with that information? And they went back to the drawing table and said, okay, well, some of the things that we see here that we feel were really valuable is the preservation of the existing trees. Obviously, to maximize the area, you know, to do that stormwater function that we needed it to do, but also to provide some of those stormwater park elements like usable green space, um, providing some walking trails, possibly some covered structures, you know, for shade and rain protection along the way and, and those picnic areas that they were looking for. And then when we had some, some interactions with the community members, one of the things that we heard from our adjacent property owners, obviously we have a residential property owner down here to the south, and we have a commercial property owner here to the west. What we heard from them was that they had some existing vegetated buffers, you know, by having this, this parcel, you know, in this, in the, basically in the sense that it was in now, which is blackberries and existing trees and brambles. So they had some separation from that parcel. They wanted to be able to maintain some kind of buffer between their parcels and ours, which was definitely understandable. Um, and finally, one of our biggest supporters for this project that let us, you know, let us know early on that they were really interested in seeing something come up here was our Kitsap Regional Library. Our, we have a partnership with our regional library with our education and outreach program at a couple of our other stormwater park locations where they provide some environmental education by doing field trips out there or guided tours or things like that. So they were pretty excited that we were putting one in in this location where they could see some advantages for adding some environmental education opportunities there. And you know, with any of the rest of our, our other projects, um, interpretive signage is always a major feature. So we were hitting on some good beats. So we went back and came out with a concept design. 
And as you can see, the concept design borrowed greatly from both the community feedback and what the stormwater division needed. Um, it's showing that we have preservation of many of those mature trees. We did the best we could in this design to lay out elements so that a lot of those trees could be preserved to the greatest extent possible. And you'll see a lot of them there. Um, there are pedestrian oriented features like a bike rack. Um, you know, we've got the walking paths around our stormwater elements. You know, it meanders, it gives you some peekaboo views, you know, which if you know anything about interpretive guidelines, you know, one of the one of the primary interpretive guidelines is to provoke and then reveal. So by having those meandering paths, you don't necessarily see everything at once. So you're inclined to move further into, you know, a, a trail or a location because you want to see what's up and around the corner. So it's very exciting that this, this design incorporated a lot of those interpretive elements. It's showing some shade structures. So again, you know, we were thinking ahead a little bit with this one. This particular lot is right down in the middle of a very developed area. We've had some pretty hot summers. Um, you know, it, it really has had us thinking about climate change and urban heat islands. And we said, hey, you know, let's let's use this to our advantage to try to offset some of that. So this design is adding some shade structures, you know, potentially with some green roofs to get that added stormwater benefit there. Um, again, it's showing the buffers, you know, between these adjacent properties to give our adjacent property owners a little bit of privacy, which we knew that they wanted. And obviously, you know, in again, in each one of our our facilities that we do, we make sure that we not only have our interpretive signage, which gives that kind of passive education piece, but we're placing things like our trash cans and our mutt pet waste stations, because those play into our other stormwater programs. So it's again, a subtle emphasis and a tie in to some of the other programs. And I heard this mentioned earlier, and I was so excited about it because, you know, this is something else that we've thought about. Um, wildflower gardens, you know, again, with the pollinators, you know, pollinators are, are losing their spaces. So wherever we can, we want to add those spaces back in. So we made some spaces in this design for wildflower gardens as well. So lessons learned from Kitsap. You've heard some of these before. I'm going to hit on them again because I, I think they're really super important. Um, we've learned this throughout the Manchester project and into some of our other ones. And, and again, you know, just in the preliminary pieces of this design. But one of the things that I find that's the most important, you know, when you're thinking about these stormwater parks is you really need to think out of the box. And I know that it can be super tempting, you know, to rubber stamp a facility, you know, I mean, to do exactly what you've done before, because you know that it works. But it's really useful to have, you know, innovative people and to create a fertile environment that encourages that. So we would not have gotten to some of the elements that we put into some of our stormwater parks, had we not opened up the table to any and all suggestions, you know, throw them all out there, sort the wheat from the chaff and, and see where you can be innovative. But that really demands high level of support for innovation and creativity. Um, you know, you really need a leader in place and a champion for those multi benefit creative solutions. And, you know, if you've got that in place, then you can challenge your staff to come up with those, you know, innovative designs that take into consideration both the community needs as well as, you know, what potential opportunities might be there on a particular location. And again, you know, I talked a little bit about our comprehensive plan earlier, and I heard something earlier about uh, parks plans. I mean, finding that way to coordinate with these other plans really expands the benefits for these projects. So, you know, again, 
rather than having a, a single focus and a single function location, you know, building upon these these different plans, building upon these different elements gets you the most bang for your buck all the way across the board. And obviously engaging with that community often and early, you know, is definitely the key. So on this slide, you know, you'll see their Christmas tree there standing in their little Christmas tree port. Um, but they also, as a community, go out and down in the bottom photo, there are some salmon cutouts that are kind of leaping art sculptures above the spiral rain garden, which is what you see in progress at the top of the picture there. And the community goes out and decorates the salmon for the holidays. So the bottom picture is our salmon wearing a little Christmas hat. He's very, very cute. Um, again, you know, I mean, engaging with that community early and often, it'll steer you in the right direction so that you gain more acceptance for that facility once it's built, because the last thing that you want is to spend a lot of money doing something that never gets used or adopted. You want your community to, to do what this Manchester community has done and really to embrace it. Again, you know, considering your limitations, you know, is also a reality, right? So look at your space, look at your funding ability and the community desire, you know, maybe the community doesn't want something big and fancy in a particular lo location. Maybe they just want, you know, what the folks down in that bottom photo did. The apartment complex there is right next to our naturalized pond. We had to go in and rehab a pond. We looked at that to see what we could do there. And what they told us was they really only wanted a trail. So we were able to add that trail. It's a small scale improvement, gave them big, big bang for their buck, gave them what they wanted and, and also worked for us. So, you know, I mean, they don't all have to be these very giant projects, you know, that are very costly and very complicated. There's more than one way to do this. And if you can't do these big projects due to funding or desire or technical ability or space, you know, maybe it's something small. Maybe it's something as small as as adding a trail around a pond. So I encourage everybody to to think about those things as they've got their opportunities moving forward. And finally, I think the biggest piece for me is, you know, the biggest lesson that we learned if I go all the way back to the very beginning of our foray into stormwater parks, which is don't just look at today. Don't just look down at the problem that you have in your lap to solve. You know, that's that's a very narrow focus. If you can widen your focus and you can look at all of the rest of the options and opportunities, you can solve a lot of challenges, not just today, but for the future. Um, so think about things like climate change. Think about things like urban heat island. Think about how things may change in the future and, and your community may be built out um, and and really try to design a project that may work for the long haul. And I'm going to leave you with this overview of our Manchester Park. Um, it's hard to imagine as I look at this, you know, knowing where we're at today, that this pretty little half acre park that's kind of unassuming what you don't see when you look at it is that it's really a powerhouse treating 100 acres of runoff. It benefits both the community who absolutely loves it, as well as their beautiful views of Puget Sound, which, you know, we all know desperately needs better water quality treatment, you know, to, to improve. Um, and this is really the power of stormwater parks. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michelle and Bethany and Jenny appreciate it. Uh, I think it might be nice to take a few minutes uh, break before we do the question and answer. Does that work, Ben? Yep, that's exactly what I was going to lead in with. So yeah, thank you again. Those were all really fantastic presentations. We will take just a five or so minute break just to give everyone a little bit of time, then reconvene um, for a Q&A session. And there's already a number of questions in there. So thank you so much for adding those and please continue to add questions. 
And just, you know, if we, in case we don't get to every single question today, uh, we can certainly uh, relay any outstanding questions to our panelists following the event. So we'll see you, uh, let's reconvene at 11.26. Okay, let's get going with the Q and A. Um, maybe just a couple, 30 seconds for our panelists to get back to the table. And really appreciate all the folks that are still here. Um, looks like most, most people are hanging around. So um, good to hear that we have some interest in these questions. And uh, maybe I'll start it off. Um, just kind of going in order of the questions that I received. Uh, first is just maybe what are some best practices in securing long-term commitments for operation and maintenance for stormwater parks? And as I ask these questions, I will uh, promote them so uh, panelists and attendees will be able to see them in the Q&A. Does Jenny or Michelle want to speak to that or you want me to? Uh, I could say a few words. There's starters. I think Michelle probably has a lot more experience with this. But again, this is the concept of letting parks lead. Um, I think when we approach our parks department, they are strapped for funding, as we all are, and are hesitant to take on a new park. And so it has to be a park that fits into the priorities of 
the parks department in order for them to be super receptive. Uh, and then including um, in our city, the public works department takes care of the stormwater piece and the parks department takes care of the parks piece. So including all of those maintenance folks really early and finding out, you know, what are elements that they maybe already have in their inventory or that they know how to maintain, you know, and, and helps with, with making things more maintainable. Um, and then if, you know, if we're looking for a new park, again, just making sure that it admits, because in our, in our city, again, we, our concept is we would build these and then turn them over to the parks department. And I'd actually be very curious to hear from Kitsap is that also the way you do it, or do you, you know, if, if stormwater builds it, they take care of it. So, yeah. So we may be kind of in the minority and have a little bit of an unusual approach. Our stormwater division manages all of our stormwater parks. So we, we don't have parks involvement in them as far as maintenance goes. They don't have the capabilities to be able to take on these additional facilities. So we said, okay, no problem there. They are in essence a stormwater facility. So we will adopt them into our maintenance program. So our staff does actually do the maintenance on them. With that said, then it's, it's really incumbent, you know, when we design these projects to make sure that we have our O&M folks at the table to make sure that, you know, even though we're installing things that are, are more park-like, you know, they still have the ability to maintain those. And another thing that I would bring up too, you know, particularly like with the Manchester Park, think about if you're, you know, if you're in a situation where you're looking at maintenance, where you could potentially have a community partner or another agency partner. For example, um, in Manchester, where that stormwater park is located is just about a half a block away from another beach park that our water district maintains the Manchester Water District. And so they're already down there mowing the lawn. So, you know, we partnered up with them and said, hey, you know, I mean, are you okay with partnering with us in this area to manage the lawn mowing portion during the summer? So we do have an agreement with them to do that. Works out really well for both of us. I know from a design perspective, it's like one of the first things we want to bring to the table is having um, parks, public works, O&M teams come to the table, agree on who's responsible for what. Because I know um, like with 132nd Square Park with Jenny, we had parks talking about maintaining the park, but public works maintaining some of the below grade structures. And we had to come up with some strategies like um, having more open swales that the parks would be maintaining and when it, you're really inside the park where it's not accessible for vehicles, um, you know, public works wanting to be able to vacuum out facilities and then having them more involved in areas that are closer to the roadways where they can bring in those larger equipment. So from a design perspective, we're always looking for where are those boundaries, who's maintaining it, um, getting consensus across the board. I also know that there are um, a lot of challenges with funding for O&M and um, working with Marysville. I know they're pursuing grants through ecology for studying the long-term needs of the stormwater systems that they're implementing, what kind of full-time employee staffing needs that they are required to have to maintain them, but also what equipment needs they need. So um, those are also opportunities as you're looking for funding that um, O&M is definitely on the forefront of needing to have it properly managed um, in the long term for these stormwater systems. Thank you for the really thoughtful answers there. Um, just going to uh, move on in the interest of time. And also just wanna acknowledge that some folks have put some really thoughtful comments in the Q&A box. I'm not sure uh, they'll generate a ton of discussion, but just wanna acknowledge that and 
uh, I think just in the interest of time, we'll continue with questions that might be a little bit more discussion oriented, but we can be sure to uh, relay any comments and questions um, following the meeting. Um, so I think the next one that maybe this is just more of a little uh, a comment and something to uh, mention for the group, but um, just to clarify or mention that all of these stormwater park funds are issued through the stormwater strategic initiative lead team, uh, which is, includes the Washington Stormwater Center and uh, Washington State Department of Commerce. So I think it was an important point to acknowledge there. And if anyone feels like they want to add to that, I'll give some space. But um, if not, I think we can also move on. Just a shout out to the NEP program is one of the few out there that funds planning, which is absolutely lovely because sometimes if you're a smaller community, Kirk, Kirkland isn't, but you know, if you're a smaller community, it's hard to even get started. And NEP is great because you can do the planning and then ecology, like the stormwater financial assistance program absolutely loves to see that progression from we planned it, now we want to build it. You know, that's just super inviting to them. So um, having that NEP funding specifically for planning is great. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this question came in during Bethany's presentation. Um, so maybe a little specific to that content, but question is how does Seattle City Light feel about siting stormwater parks within their power line easements? Does this represent an operation and maintenance concern to them? And could this be a programmatic approach for identifying underutilized land for implementing stormwater parks? I can speak that a little and then Bethany, if you wanna to add to that. Um, yes, uh, Seattle City Light has, has very, very, um, what at first appear to be inflexible requirements for what happens under their power lines. Uh, no trees needs to be easily accessible for maintenance. You know, lot, lots of very strict requirements. Um, I I worked with them on another um, bioretention that was on land that was owned by Seattle City Light, and they were like, absolutely no open water. And then we pointed out that it's actually a spot where Kirkland has had a pond for years and years. And so, I think there's some room for negotiation and flexibility there. You just need to make sure you present it and work with them in a way that says, you know, we're gonna take care of your needs. We're gonna provide that maintenance access that you need, you know, and this is, you know, gonna be a great community amenity. Cause yeah, it's a lot of land and it's a lot of space that could potentially be used for stormwater and for other community benefits. And so um, it's, it's a great opportunity and one that you just need to be really careful to work with Seattle City Light on their needs and, you know, sort of a little bit of push pill. Um, you know, when they first hear stormwater pond, they're like, absolutely not, you know, but then when you start saying, well, it drains down very quickly, um, it, it's not gonna have trees, you know, you, you just start working with their constraints, then you can get to some creative planning and, and I hope make it work. Yeah, you've seen a, we've seen a lot of, park elements going on under power lines. So it's not an unusual application. I've seen a lot of trails um, like in Seattle and Shoreline and I think in Kirkland as well. Also in um, old road, road, railroad corridors. I know Kirkland has some of those and Seattle does. Um, so it's knowing, you know, what are some of the concerns from Seattle City Light? For us on the design side, we're also thinking about construction. How do we get vehicles in and out? Um, for the one that we were working with Jenny on, we talked a lot with our geotechnical engineer, making sure that they're aware of the power lines and where to put their borings and clearances from those utilities. Um, the same thing will need to occur for construction, making that very clear up front on the drawing specifications and during the walkthroughs with the contractor that they're bidding it appropriately for those restrictions under the power lines. Um, but I think uh, having parks under power lines, I mean, you see it all over our area. This is a lot of um, area that 
historically had missed opportunity for open spaces and you know there's a lot of restrictions on what you can do under them and so having the park I think is just an absolute um, great benefit for that community instead of having this vacant area that um, gets a lot of unattractive behaviors occurring in it um, now it's going to be a beautiful stormwater and public space amenity Excellent, thank you. Um, hopefully folks are able to see the questions that I'm promoting. I've just gotten a, a couple of messages saying there's a couple technical difficulties, but um, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you are having issues seeing the questions or typing them in. Um, but to move on, um, I think this is a question for Michelle. Um, I'd like to hear about what was done with the Silverdale in Manchester Park's marine outfall design. Were they retrofitted or left in their original condition? Yeah, thanks, Allison. I forgot to tell you about the outfall because I was so excited to tell you about the stormwater park. <laughs> but yes, um, particularly in Manchester, that was actually part of the stormwater park project. So we replaced that outfall from that Poor little battered pipe that you saw there that was undersized and, and in sad shape to a nice big box outfall um, underneath their pier out there. And the really cool part about that is I know I told you guys in a previous answer about Manchester Water and their little park down there on, on the waterfront. Um, when we did the work on the outfall, it also triggered them to do a revamp of that whole little park. So that community really got a lot of bang for their buck out of that project because in a very short period of time, it improved quite a bit of their downtown core there between the two projects. So yeah, we, we did actually tackle the outfall in that Manchester project as well. With the one in Silverdale, of course, that one's still in development. So, you know, to be determined, that could be, you know, as part of that project, it could be an add on, you know, we're evaluating that right now. Any other thoughts or insights? I know it's kind of a Kitsap County specific question. So, it's might give the combine, you know, like, like with Kirkland's project we had again we had an aging and failing stormwater line and we see that as an opportunity to combine forces so it's always easier to do those projects together right you know i mean you're mobilizing out there you're bidding out a project the more elements that you can wrap in together the better um, you know, I mean, for example, the Manchester project had some parking improvements too that our roads department joined in on. So you want to get all of that bang for your buck that you possibly can via those partnerships. All right. So this next question is also addressed to Michelle, but I think uh, others might have some insights as well. Um, the question is, what do you think are barriers to staff receptivity to community ideas? Is it time, lack of muscle memory around listening to community needs that might diverge from the thoughts of stormwater managers and planners, and how do you remove that barrier? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think it's a little bit of muscle memory. It's an approach that you've got to get your head around and then promote, you know, throughout your staff. So again, you know, I, I talked about kind of that knee jerk, you know, just plug and play everything that we know that we know how to do, you know, and, and sometimes that doesn't do us any favors. So, I mean, that one really came up and kind of hit us in the chops with the Manchester project, right? You know, I mean, we had come to, you know, we'd, we'd come to what we were gonna do and by golly, we were just gonna go out there and do it. And then the community told us absolutely positively not. So I, I think that was one of the key moments, you know, where we had to go back as, as staff and say, wow, you know, we need to take a totally different approach here because, you know, I mean, the adoption for these projects is, is going to be nil and, and nobody wants to fight a project 
that's in opposition. One of the cool things that we found as we were going through that process with Manchester was um, a matrix with public participation on a spectrum, basically, from inform, which basically is a promise to the public that, hey, we're just going to keep you informed about what we're doing, but we're not really going to give you any input into it. That's kind of one end of the spectrum to the opposite end of the spectrum, which is empowerment. And basically that looks like, okay, we're gonna let you tell us what you want and then we're gonna implement whatever you decide that we're gonna do. And we looked at that and said, okay, as an agency, where do we wanna be on that spectrum as it relates to this project? And where we fell was kind of somewhere in the middle there, you know, in, in the involve or collaborate phase. Um, it's a really good graphic. It's from the International Association for Public Participation. I'll drop a link to that in the chat. You may want to, to check that out because I think it's a really useful way, you know, to talk to staff about how to get your head around how to participate with the public and their input and also get internal needs met, you know, because it's a balancing act, right? And maybe the other sir will have some suggestions along that route too. Yeah, any other comments? I think the muscle memory is a really important part of it. I hear a lot from maintenance groups that their funding is only for mow and blow. And a lot of these stormwater facilities make it very challenging to maintain and operate. So. Um, part of it is understand, really listening and understanding um, where they're coming from and what they have available to them and recognizing that. And um, so for this is specific to, you know, the staff um, commitment to it. Um, and then the next step being, you know, what do they need? to be able to maintain these facilities? Do they need new equipment? Do they need new training? Do they need new, um, more full-time employees, staff? Um, so that's part of it too, is getting um, recept receptivity from your groups. Um, also re-educating groups that this is for salmon and orca as well, and getting that commitment um, from everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we do have about 15 minutes left. Um, so I think we can get through a few more questions here today. Um, so I think a, maybe a couple more general questions. Um, this is a pretty meaty one. So I think this might be a good discussion. Um, but what opportunities have you seen for public stewardship programs within parks? As a forest steward for the Greater Green Seattle Partnership, and as someone who helps out with other similar programs, I've seen firsthand the level of community engagement and investment in spaces that this can bring. Uh, however, the realities of stormwater infrastructure maintenance and restoration can be more challenging or technical. And if opportunities exist, to what extent is it possible for that public stewardship to be autonomous? So I'll put that in the answered column. So uh, you guys can at least see the, the text, but um, I'll We'll turn it over. I can jump in with my limited knowledge of the city of Arlington Stormwater Wetland Park. I know they um, have volunteers help with the maintenance, so I think that's primarily weeding, and I'm sure they have staff helping them to identify what the weeds are, um, but um, they, they were very excited about that volunteer program, and um, I think like the development of the park and the community engagement with that kind of led to that volunteer group being able to help out. I'm sure there are some other good examples too from the other folks here. Yeah. There's a nonprofit called Dirt Core, and I think they do a lot of uh, green stormwater infrastructure training, how to maintain, and also to help elevate people into green careers. Um, I've seen them working with communities in Seattle. Yeah, Kirkland has a strong uh, Green Kirkland partnership um, that started with the aim of uh, removing invasive plants from uh, natural areas, publicly owned natural areas. 
Um, but it's been nice to see them sort of expand focus a little bit to include um, other types of parks and other types of vegetation. Um, so now they have park stewards for a, a wider variety of different kinds of parks. Um, and our surface water utility actually funds a portion of our Green Circle partnership. And so um, we work with them on, you know, what does that mean in terms of <laughs> providing um, surface water services, including, you know, volunteers to help. Um, and so I would hope that there would be a place for volunteers in, in maintenance. So. And not park specific, but programs like Rainwise, where you mm -hmm. train small contractors to help homeowners to incorporate stormwater strategies on their properties. Um, you know, there's been a lot of programs like that to for smaller projects that so include stormwater infrastructure. My laptop is about to die. I will be back in one second. I'm gonna go okay. to the board. <laughs> Of the joys of remote work sometimes. Um, well, we might have covered a similar question here, but I think this is uh, pretty interesting. So, and we have a little bit of time, so I'll bring it to the group as well. Um, starts off, maintenance is key, especially if the stormwater park is owned and owned by a parks department and functions for utility purpose. Can you speak more to the conditions for maintenance? In both design agreement and practice, what challenges have you seen? So again, yeah, kind of speaking to that operation and maintenance question, but uh, wanted to see if there's any other insights here. So, you know, like we talked about before, making sure that we have a clear understanding of who is maintaining, you know, with a stormwater park there, are aspects of that park that may be maintained by parks and there are aspects that may be maintained by public works. Um, so having both parties at the table, understanding what the requirements are for maintaining so that they can agree on who's maintaining which, or, um, sorry, did the question disappeared on me. Oh, there that was is. my bad. I was moving stuff around. <laughs> Still don't know how Zoom works. So yes, but maintenance is definitely key and it is a huge challenge. Um, so one of the things that I have helped a couple cities with is getting, um, if we're implementing a proprietary system, having them come and talk to the O&M team on what the requirements are, what they're going to need to be trained for, you know, the ease of maintenance, what kind of tools and equipment they should have. Um, so we've done that in a few jurisdictions, which kind of helps alleviate some of the stress and concerns of the O&M team that they start seeing, oh, this is something we can handle. This is something we can get trained for. There's also um, contracts available for private O&M or for training your O&M team on how to do specific um, uh, replacements and maintenance of different um, strategies. So um, those are just a few things that we've seen um, implemented. Yeah, so those are all super important. Um, one additional thing that we're doing is our finance folks are actually trying to develop uh, maintenance um, cost and budget that would be somehow would come alongside the capital project. Like as you build it, you say, okay, you're going to need this much for maintenance. And um, it'll, I don't know that we could include that in the capital budget. It's, you know, for the actual project, but at least we know about it and can make room for it and find space for it because it is becoming a real problem. Every time you talk to our maintenance folks now about a new stormwater facility, they're like, oh, you know, another one of these water quality things, and you can't just count it like a regular catch basin because it takes a lot more time and effort than a typical catch basin. And and I hear that loud and clear. And so we really need to find, and, and we've been doing it incrementally. You know, we'll do a master plan, a surface water master plan that says, wow, we've added a thousand catch basins, therefore we need this many people. But it's always sort of backward looking. So now we're looking to try to figure out a way to be a little more, you know, real time with, with providing the maintenance budget as we build the stuff. 
Jenny, I think that's brilliant. I, I, I love that. And I want to steal that because I, I think that's the forward thinking way, you know, to pair up with, you know, building facilities, right? That's fabulous. Um, I just wanted to add to the conversation too, you know, if there are any of my fellow NPDES permittees in the room, you know that, you know, we just had to go through a process of revising SOPs, you know, for all of our different um, best management practices. So that was a really good exercise for Kitsap because what it triggered for us was to get some really good solid maintenance SOPs in place for things like these larger multifunctional facilities. Um, and what that looks like, you know, for something like Manchester that has a lot of different things going on and of different types, it actually has its own maintenance booklet that tells you, you know, here is how you maintain and how often this particular BMP needs maintained. Here is how you handle this particular one, which, you know, has become really important for us because, you know, it it is a time of great turnover between retirements and, and other things. So we've got a lot of new folks coming on that are, are training up on these things that maybe weren't around when we first installed them and had the benefit of, like Bethany said, you know, talking to the proprietary folks that walked them through in the very beginning. So how do you pass down, you know, kind of that institutional knowledge? For us, it's been really important and really incumbent upon us to have some good written procedures down so that you can just hand them to somebody and say, okay, here's how you do it if I'm not here to tell you. So that can be useful as you're thinking about your O&M as well. Great, I think we just have one time for one more question. And it's just a little bit of a follow-up for this last one. And it's uh, how pollution accumulation is managed kind of in the process. Uh, I guess I, um, well, this is sometimes challenging to get through to the public, but soils are really, really good at trapping and transforming pollutants um, and don't necessarily become super polluted. Um, yeah. I. I so I think that's a first thing is that there's this perception of like, oh, it's stormwater, it's dirty, which is true. Um, but soils are also super good at, at that transformation process. That said, if you have a spill and you do need to do regular maintenance of your facilities to remove sediment that does contain a lot of pollutants. Um, so it's sort of a, a combination of the two. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just tack on to that. Um, so a lot of these systems include biological and chemical functions that help break down those pollutants. Um, there's a lot of uh, science being done to watch um, what is specifically happening. So for instance, um, we have heavy metals in our stormwater and so the chemical processes are changing it. I believe it's from light metals to heavy metals so that they're able to be captured within the soils. Um, and then you have a lot of biological functions. Um, there's a lot of um, smaller organisms that help break down oils, for instance. And there's a lot of um, newer studies going on with um, pervious pavements that's looking at some of the biological um, blooms that you see in those pavement systems and how they're processing oils. Um, and a lot of the pollution is just dirt. We call it suspended solids. It's, um, it really is just dirt. Um, it's suspended. It's very small. It creates that muddy looking stormwater. And so a lot of these systems allow for it to drop down into the bottom of the system and that can be vacuumed up or it can be processed and turned into part of the soil layers as well. Um, so when we talk about pollution accumulation, a lot of these systems are breaking down the pollution and um, creating um, a, a perfectly natural system to process that material. It's not like we have to ship a lot of this material, this pollution off site. They're staying in the soils, they're trapped there, and they're being broken down through biological and chemical properties and functions. 
I, I have maybe a funny story to tack on to that and a cautionary tale. Um, when we did the Manchester Park, there are some roadside rain gardens that are also part of that park. And we, we did our plant order, you know, as you do for anything like that. And then we, our, our staff goes out and plants whatever comes in. And we had originally ordered some of the little native strawberries as part of that rain garden. So everything went as planned. It was all installed. We went out to take a look after everything had started to grow and, and thrive throughout the summer. And we happened to be walking through the park one day and realized that there are these great big, absolutely gorgeous thumb sized strawberries growing out of the rain garden right there alongside the curb really attractive to just about anybody that might want to come by and pick them and eat them. They had given us rather than the natives actual big, you know, ever bearing garden strawberries. So that was a quick lesson on keeping an eye on what you get and making sure that, you know, your public outreach is adequate to keep people from eating out of your rain gardens. <laughs> Maybe not the the greatest ones for you to snack on possibly i think that's a really fantastic way to end this session i think a little bit of a cautionary tale don't eat the berries um but again i really want to thank thank our panel and erica for putting this event on i know this this regional stormwater parks work is really is is really a long time coming so it was really fantastic to see um, kind of how it's all come together and some conclusions from that, but definitely more more to come. And I think um, we definitely had some questions that didn't get fully addressed today. So we'll be sure that our panel is um, has access to those and has access to contact information from our attendees if you have any other follow-up questions. Before we break, I do want to uh, just make it known that we do have a Title VI survey uh, that we are asking folks to voluntarily complete today. And I'll just put up a little slide to that effect. Um, but, and then the survey will, link will pop up as soon as the event concludes, but just wanna, oops, sorry. I think my screen isn't working. Of course, at the very end of this all, um, well, I'm just gonna put the details in the chat so everyone can see them. Um, but yeah, if you feel uh, interested in taking the survey, please do so, it would help us with some Title VI requirements. And with that, I think I will let everyone go and have a wonderful rest of the Friday and a wonderful weekend. Enjoy that extra hour of sleep on Sunday. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Unfortunately, you. I'm a parent, so no extra sleep for parents. Yeah. <laughs> you can sleep when they're 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the two-year-old does not sleep in. <laughs> it's one extra hour for activities, though. Yeah. <laughs>